Good evening. My name is Pam Platt, and I've been asked to have a conversation with Colleen tonight. And she and I are going to speak for about 15 minutes, and then we're going to open it up for questions uh, from you all. Um, I think most of us in this room know who your great-great-grandmother was. Uh, other folks who might be tuning in might not know. What do you think are the most relevant points about her life that you would like to share with the folks who might not have heard so much about her? That's a good question. Lots of good. I think what's important to know is that she's a pioneer. And this, can, I come from Connecticut, so it's really wonderful to come to Kentucky. Um, and it, so she's a pioneer in women's rights. And why is that so? There. OK. She's a pioneer in women's rights. And what's important to understand about her is that she grew up in a soup of law. Law was all around her. Her father was a lawyer. Uh, her father was the judge down the street in the courthouse. At the time, in the early 1800s, there weren't law schools. So people would come to study with a lawyer and learn the law. So all in their house, there were lawyers, law, everything. And for instance, that's a nice necklace you have on. Let's make you into Elizabeth as a 10-year-old. Okay. okay? And we're going to transform your necklace into a coral necklace. And you just got it for Christmas. OK, so there's a law clerk that wants to bait Elizabeth. And he says, that's a nice necklace. Who owns that necklace? Elizabeth, who owns it? I do. Oh, how did you get it? Uh, I worked for it. Well, no, it's a Christmas present. Okay. You're just a child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter made it. <laughs> uh, OK. Uh, well, the law clerk informs Elizabeth, the child, saying, you know, Elizabeth, when you get married, your husband will own it. And what I like about children is they have a very strong sense of right and wrong, as well as adults. So she, she was indignant, but that was the law. And when a woman got married, due to old English law of coverture, that the woman ceased to exist, or as Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, the woman became civilly dead in the eyes of the law. And what's interesting, that's one of the first laws that got changed in New York State. And I noticed that in Kentucky, about 10 years later, that also got changed. So in the late 1800s. Uh, so that's one of the stories I think that uh, the most important thing to answer your question is, think of Elizabeth as connecting women and law. And of course, rights, legal rights are law. So that's the best way to understand her. And it's not like Abigail Adams who says, Dear John, please remember the ladies and don't do the same things that King George III did to you. So uh, that's sort of an appeal. It's not really saying we want rights. So what's really interesting, if you want another way to remember her, I'm going to tell you another little story, and that is in their town, in Johnstown, New York, which is near Albany, every year they read the Declaration of Independence aloud. And it was a ceremony. And so Elizabeth is listening to this thing, and she says, great, great ideas in here, wonderful ideas. Because, you know, it wasn't that long ago, 1776. Um, that wasn't long ago, for instance, her father, you know, her grandfather fought in the American Revolution. So that, that's in their recent memory. So this great document, the, Declar the Declaration of Independence, what did it say again? It said, help me, all men are created equal. They're endowed by, come on, help me, their creator with certain inalienable. inalienable rights among them life liberty and pursuit of happiness great great ideas but here this young woman is looking around and she said hey wait a minute 
all men are created equal, but wait, your property rights are different from my property rights. Exactly. What happened there? So fast forward, this young woman grows up, as we all do, uh, and she's 32, and she, oh, uh, wait, this back up to when she's 25. She, met, she meets Henry Brewster Stanton, who's in another lawyer attorney, but he's involved with abolition. And where do you go on your honeymoon? Like a lot of people from New York went to Niagara, Niagara Falls. So I don't know where you all went, but uh, the point is that she went to London for the first World Anti-Slavery Conference. Oh. Now, did you think of that for a honeymoon? <laughs> OK, <laughs> why not? <laughs> um, so she's over there with her husband, and she's just a young bride. But there's another really important, important woman there, Lucretia Mott, who's a oh, Quaker yeah. from Philadelphia. She doesn't come as the young bride attached to somebody. She comes as a delegate from the United States to the first World Anti-Slavery Convention. So what is the first order of business at such a convention? Shall we discuss slavery? It's in the title. Now, what did they discuss? No, they discussed whether women should speak or not speak. <laughs> And what was their decision? No. No, women do not speak. Uh, which, OK, Elizabeth, OK, she's just 25 and a wife of somebody. What about Lucretia Mott? No, she's a delegate. Yeah. She was sent over by America to represent an American point of view on anti-slavery. So, so what happened is that they sort of go off the streets of London talking about, we got to work on our problems too. And the idea is that they decide, let's have our own convention. Let's call it the Women's Rights Convention. And so fast forward, when Lucretia Mott, several years later, is in Seneca Falls, they call a convention. And you, you might think this is a really organized process. No, what they do is they get together with Lucretia Maud there, and they have a, a handful of people who talk and while they're having tea. And Elizabeth's really venting. And so as she's stirring the tea, she's fomenting revolution. So the spoon. <laughs> The spoon is her tool, and her mouth, and her brain. So fomenting, and then they said, let's have a women's rights convention. So they put an ad in the paper, you, you, you know, and then, then within a week or so, they've got this convention, and then they say, holy moly, what is our document? What is our statement of purpose? And so this, this statement, they meet another time a few days later, and they said, oh my god, this is as hard to figure out as inventing a steam engine. <laughs> this is, you know, industrial period. And so what they come up with is say, hey, remember that Declaration of Independence? Good enough for 1776 when a group of people didn't like their king or their power so they decided to model their Declaration of Independence after the 1776 Declaration of Independence. So now I'm going to ask you, you don't even know, maybe, I mean, you're also well read, but I'm going to start, I'm going to take a passage out of the, uh, the 1848 Declaration of Independence, and it starts out, all men and women are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Perfect, right? And then they set up their grievances, just like the men did. <laughs> For instance, women didn't have access to higher education. No colleges were open to them. 
They didn't have access, and if you don't, you know, you can't, if you don't get this education, you don't have access to professions. Um, in the eyes of the law, they're civilly dead. If you contracted and got wages, you couldn't contract. Those wages belong to your husband. And that's the same with your clothes, your possessions, even the land that you might have inherited goes to your husband because a woman, a married woman can't contract. Well, yeah, let me ask you this, Colleen. I think I turned it off. Anyway, let me ask you this, Colleen. Um, that was in 1848. Exactly. Okay. Uh, and she died in what year? 1902. 1902. And then we finally uh, got the right to vote, or the 19th Amendment passed in 1920. Right. So she kept at it for another 50 years. Exactly. Okay, so what kept her going, and what can we sort of extrapolate from her life and example for us to keep going until we finally reach fu full equality? I think... Uh, so those are many questions. What kept her going? Uh, she was always doing the same thing. For instance, excuse me, the most radical thing in that declaration is the fundamental right of citizenship. What's the fundamental right of citizenship? The vote. Because if you want to voice to shape your nation, it's called a vote. So that, that was so radical that Lucretia Mott said, the, you'll make us look ridiculous. Too radical. Does anybody in this room think it's radical that you have a vote? OK. Now. Now, but back then, that was very radical. And so at the end of her life, she was also radical. So she's always looking into the future, identifying problems now, and she's very analytical. She's maybe 50, 75 years ahead of her time mm -hmm. because there, there was only one person who supported her at the Women's Rights Convention, Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. who attended. Uh, other, she had to work hard to convince the group to the value of your right to vote. So, um, but she kept going. But I have to ask you, why do you keep going? Why do you keep going? Why do you keep going? Because you have fire in your belly and you don't have to look to Elizabeth Cady Stanton as a solution. It's like, I think it's, we're like a hydra. And that's like an organism with lots of different heads. So I was talking to, I live near New York City. I was taking a train to New York City. I'm sitting next to a woman and I say, well, what did, like, she pointed out she went to University of Virginia. And I said, well, what did you make with your, what did you do with your life? She says, I'm a buyer for the big department stores. And then she said, and I said, did you do anything for the women's, you know, with, she said, I did a small thing. I worked, I let the people who worked for me to have a better work-life balance. Mm -hmm. And I said, that is not that's a, a big thing. That's yeah. not a small thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what I believe, is that all of you are change agents. And all of you have, even if they cut my head off, you are other heads to this animal that has multiple mm -hmm. heads. Well, one of the things that I know that you're still working on, yes. and that a lot of us are still interested in, and that we still don't have, is the Equal Rights Amendment. Can you tell us about your, your work with that and what you see happening with that in the country? Well, um, some people think that the Equal Rights Amendment is from the 1970s. I don't, I don't under, where, you know, learn history. The Equal <laughs> Rights Amendment is almost 100 years old just as the 19th Amendment is. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give you a gift. And this is the gift, um, and it's a flag. And you see the stars on it? This woman here, Alice Paul, on the anniversary of the first Women's Rights Convention, she went back to Seneca Falls in 1923, and she proposed the Equal Rights Amendment. And it's this, yeah, it's the same thing as the right to vote, that your right to vote 
any person's right to vote shall not be denied on the basis of sex. Um, yeah, so that you can be mm -hmm. man and right. not be denied female. Mm -hmm. not, right. Okay. And then um, it's just an extension of that, mm -hmm. that your, your rights will not, your other rights, in addition to voting mm -hmm. rights, shall not be denied. Right. To me, it's like so simple, so logical. And what's really cool is Alice sewed a star on for each state that ratified the 19th Amendment. And so Kentucky was which state that ratified the 19th Amendment? Uh, well, we'll find that out. Uh, <laughs> and what, so at the time, you needed 36 states to change the Constitution. Well, um, what's, oh, I'm so sorry. What's really <laughs> exciting is to ratify, to change the US Constitution for the Equal Rights Amendment we're at 37 states right now. Illinois and Nevada just recently ratified it. And we're hoping that Virginia, North Carolina, Kentucky, that you ratify it too. Mm -hmm. And then let's go. I hope we do. I saved my ERA bracelet from the 1970s. I wish I'd worn it tonight. But I'm going to have to break that thing out again and start yeah. wearing it every day. Um, so you're fighting for that. You're also working, um, I think, didn't you get some news recently about uh, statues in oh, Central yeah. Park? That there are no women statues except for Alice in Wonderland and Mother Goose in Central Park. And... Uh, yeah. But we're now going to have what in Central Park? Well, it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. So again, this is a simple thing. A husband and wife were walking through Central Park, and they're looking around, and they see all these male statues, famous men with names and paper trails and histories. And of course, Mother Goose, Alice in Wonderland, a witch, an angel, a goddess. You know, these mm -hmm. are females, the females. And they said, where are the real women? So six years later, we have gone through tremendous hoops. We've gotten prime real estate in Central Park, right on the mall. And our three statues in honor of the 19th Amendment, it's one statue. See, we, we got permission for one statue, but we had three women in it. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Sojourner Truth. Yay. And these three women, yeah, look at that. Oh, turn the camera around. Mm -hmm. Isn't that exciting? And these three women lives intersected. For instance, when Sojourner Truth was at a conference in New York City, she stayed w in the Stanton home. Mm -hmm. And this is another story how these generations go down. So Elizabeth's daughter, Harriet, who was a child, mm -hmm. she had the job of reading for her older aunts that had bad eyesight. Mm -hmm. And she had to read the journal, suffrage journals and the newspapers. And then she, her job was to read for Sojourner Truth. And she said to Sojourner, you have good eyesight. Why am I reading for you? What was Sojourner's answer? Perfect. I can't read those itty bitty characters, but I can read men. Wow. Very powerful. And the reverse effect is that Harriet, the child, grew up and put in her memoirs that Sojourner Truth taught me not to look at the little itty characters, but to read men. That's a great story. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And I want to ask you one more question before we open it up okay. to folks. Um, and this is about the end of Elizabeth's life and about your favorite quote of hers. Uh, I know that reading Solitude of Self yes. had a big impact on you, as it does on a lot of people who read it for the first time. And, but this, is, this also addresses what you just said, that it's up to all of us not just to you know yeah. Elizabeth Cady Stanton. So please share this with us sure. and tell us why it means so much to you. Well, uh, 
Solitude of Self is available on the internet. It's a very reflective speech. And this is one aspect that I like. Nothing strengthens the judgment and quickens the conscience like individual responsibility. So this shifts it around to you. Uh, your conscience, your individual responsibility, and uh, that's what it's all about. It's not about looking up to all of these people that um, Nellie Bly, Sojourner Truth, um, you know, don't look up there, but look to yourselves, your own conscience, and your judgment and take action. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And your, oh, thank, thank you. you. And your questions now for Colleen. Yes. Well, yeah. I just have a comment that Elizabeth Cady Stanton was doing all this when she had a house full of children. She had seven children. And I always have admired that because I raised eight children. Yes. I know how busy you can be with, with that. And so, the question is that, your, the comment is that Elizabeth Cady had seven children and this lovely lady had eight children. And how do you juggle uh, all of this stuff? And she yeah. had um, phenomenal people around her that were supportive. Uh, but also, I think that she was, she called herself a caged lioness. <laughs> the, the cage is the house and this lion. So she, I don't think the world of domesticity was complete. She loved her home, she loved her family, she loved, but she needed these big ideas and yeah. uh, she was the writer, the, um, the philosopher of a movement. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, so How's this? <laughs> <laughs> Great. So the comment is that uh, it's disagreeing a little bit that uh, don't negate the leaders of the past because they are role models. Um, and I would agree, you can get tremendous ideas. Basically, every single work of Elizabeth Cady Stanton is dumped on the internet. And the beauty of it, for instance, her memoir called 80 Years and More is dumped on, and you can do word search. For instance, you can word search coral necklace, and you get that incredibly good story. She's quite entertaining when you read her. And then, you know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, when they're older, they didn't want this history lost. And Susan B. Anthony had copious collections of letters and journals, and, and they, sat down and they wrote the history of women's suffrage multiple volumes and that is amazing project gutenberg dumped it online and you know what's really fun is that in one of the volumes they do the state history so you can go in and do kentucky state history and there it's preserved and i was just telling somebody i hate i have a big allergy some are allergic to cats or dogs. I'm allergic to forgotten woman. Yeah. I, it's like, what? Yeah. They worked very hard. It's us that must use ourselves a little bit to be inspired or to be knowledgeable. <laughs> they're not forgotten. I mean, they're, they're out there the whole time. It's that we're a little lazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. I think that's really important, and it is true with everything, that you must build in succession. This is, and especially if you're going to f fight a war for four, 72 years, 
We're not talking about the Gettysburg, the Civil War, the American Revolution, where they are very short time wars. No, this is three generational war to get the right to vote. So if you don't build in succession and the next generation and the next generation, and is our, is our situation perfect now? No. So everybody's got to push that ceiling a little higher. And mentor, and we have some wonderful young people here tonight. What, what, what's really strange is, I think when you're a child, everything around you is the world. You don't have perspective. This is my childhood. My father died when I was three, okay? He's gone. I don't know him at all. Um, so I have my mother. Thank God she, uh, you know, she had a degree in architecture. Uh, so I had a brother that, quite frankly, strangled to death when he was born because the umbilical cord. So here's my mother losing her husband, having a dead child. She almost died, having my brother and myself. I talk about disease, death, chaos, you know. And then where's the support? Well, there was my grandmother, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's granddaughter. She was America's, one of America's first female civil engineers. So she was successful professionally in her own right, but she was supportive of my mother um, in helping with architecture and stuff. So, but none of my grandfathers were alive either. So my world was like two powerful women. That's my world. And I just thought that that was normal. And so nobody had to do, <laughs> nobody had to talk to me about women's rights because and the woman's place in society and all that. I was just living it. And, and furthermore, they were so busy working, supporting families, kids, all sorts of stuff, that um, they didn't sit down, come sit on my lap, little <laughs> girl. I'm going to tell you about Elizabeth Cady Stan. So I really learned about it when I was later in life, 17. I went mm -hmm. to Seneca Falls. And the national park didn't even exist. Now it's a national park. And we've supported them for 50 years. So, um, and the strange thing is, we, I went to my grandmother's house. Of course, she designed her own house. Mm -hmm. when, when, isn't that normal? And then, um, and, <laughs> so, um, and then in the attic, it's full of the original works. And by the way, I brought Elizabeth Cady Stanton's women's Bible here to Louisville, Kentucky for the dedication of the Josephine Henry roadside marker in, um, in Versailles. Help me, I say Versailles. Versailles. But I mean, what is it Versailles. called? Versailles. Versailles. <laughs> Versailles, Kentucky near uh, at Lexington. And tomorrow you're all invited to come. And this is a network of Votes for Women trail across the United States. And Kentucky is leading the way uh, because you are now on your third roadside marker. So con congratulations, Kentucky. Oh, by the way, the president is Marsha Weinstein. Yes. yes. Yeah. You can't do everything. I don't think you have to call yourselves imperfect if you can't do everything that you think about in vision. I mean, you just do the best you can and work to the best of your abilities, but also work with the options around you. You don't have to go to the moon to accomplish something. It's, uh, this is actually a great story. My mother um, won an award from the National Organization of Women. And so at the award ceremony, my mother quoted 
Eleanor Roosevelt, who had a great story. And it's about these people going up the Amazon River in South America. And they're on a boat, and they're running out of water. They can't, you know, their thirst is increasing. And so the story is just put your bucket down and bring it up and drink it. So the point is none of us have to, we just put those buckets down, bring them back up, and, you know, and all around us there's things to do. And just do it to the best of your ability. And I don't want to call myself imperfect. Why should I label that on mine? I mean, it's, uh, we're all trying our best. Let's just, you know, deal with that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Um, you told the story about Bodie, your grandmother, and maybe your brother going into Bodie booth when we were talking about Oh, yeah. So um, I think next um, November, the League of Women Voters, that's actually 100 years old, too, because the League people... Uh, no, first women got the right to vote, and then the league organized because saying, okay, you got the right to vote, but do you know what you're voting about? Have you listened to the different candidates? So the league is like saying, be informed when you vote. We're going to put on debates. We're going to put stuff on the Internet. And so I think next November everybody should take their mother, their grandma, their child, whatever, to the voting booth, take a photo of it, and send it into the newspaper at, at just before the voting days to show that it's a group thing. And for instance, my son, who's six, six foot five, went with my mother, who's the great granddaughter of Elizabeth, into this voting booth in Connecticut where you had the curtain and the lever. And so Eric's like sticking out at the top, and you can see their four legs at the bottom. And uh, so then they're voting there. You can bring people into the voting booth. Everybody knows that. Because if you can't read, you can bring in assistant, well, yeah. things like that. Um, and, then, um, and then they open the curtain, and then I take a picture of them coming out. Is that the story? Well, plus the one about the older woman, too. Oh, this is so great. We act, there's a statue in Washington, D.C. that is of the three suffragists, Lucretia Mott, Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and that was done in honor of the 19th Amendment. It was donated to the Congress. They refused it. Do you think they're taking no for an answer? No. They put the seven tons of marble on an ox cart, drag it over to the Capitol, and re-gift it. <laughs> so it goes into the Capitol. And then the next thing is put down in the crypt called the Land of the Dead. Not even yeah. George Washington wanted to be buried there. So then it took 75 years to bring the statue back up. Yeah. And um, the we, we made a documentary about this whole statue. And I found a 105-year-old woman in our town, Greenwich, Connecticut, who voted with the passage of the 19th Amendment. And she told the story. She said, my, myself, she was very young, my mother, my grandmother went up the stairs to the school to vote. And her whole face is like crinkling up. She's a 105-year-old woman. She's, you can see she's getting all stressed. And she said, we didn't know how to vote. Because they had never voted before, all three of them. They didn't have the right to vote. And then she said, and then we went in and we voted. And then we left and we had cake and coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so you could see the whole imprint of emotions on her face and the joy of doing it and celebrating. Yeah. Ooh. So in how many years was the statue in the crypt? When did it come up? Uh, yeah, it was uh, the statue called the Portrait Monument because it's yeah, or this suffrage statue, uh, was um, in the crypt for about 75 years. See, it's very good to try and take advantage of anniversaries. They thought the 75th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, let's bring it up. It took a little bit longer, but at the turn of the last century, it finally came up. And it's there for you to view. Yeah. It was 1998, I think it came up. Yeah. <laughs> 
Because they people worked have been on trying it. and trying yeah. and trying. It, oh, this is hysterical. You raised hell, pretty much, right? Well, no, yeah. we don't raise hell. I think, you know, just like I would. shooting <laughs> off emotions like that, they go everywhere. And, you know, like, let's be strategic. So the point is that it takes two acts of Congress to move anything into the rotunda. Because it's jointly owned by the House and the Senate. So you get your, go to law. You get a law in on the House side. You get a law, in, you know, pass a bill on the Senate side. And then finally, that was passed. And then somebody slipped in an amendment saying, the US Congress will never pay a cent to move that statue. And I became good friends with the capital of the architect, Alan Hantman. He said, that is unprecedented that a piece of art owned by the capital or the US government for over 75 years wouldn't be moved with government money. But the men were slipped in and voted and passed, so then we raised $75,000 to move that statue up. So if you hear no, think yes. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, and I have one more too. Got it. I wanted to, uh, to uh, what, um, I wanted to ask you about the current Women's History Museum. Oh yeah. The status of that. Well, that's very interesting because the Women's History Museum started with the success of the statue, and uh, of course that's a very big leap between raising seventy-five thousand and five hundred thousand. Uh, you know, whatever museums cost nowadays. So it's incremental, and one of the best things they do is they have an online site. So to me, it's a privilege to go to Washington, D.C., but you know it's expensive, it takes time. If you have a family, it's five times more expensive. So I would say they're open now 24-7, not only to Americans, but to 7 billion people around the world. And as much as I like bricks and mortar museums, I think go to your internet. That is the, your new museum. And go to the Fraser too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I meant to ask you earlier, um, what do you think Elizabeth would be very proud and happy of that everyone has achieved? And what would she still be impatient with and yeah. for? Yeah. I think I attend, I've only been in Louisville, Kentucky for less than 24 hours. And I've already been to four meetings. This is my fifth. Okay, so I attended one yesterday at the Fraser Museum, which is, for instance, putting on a 4,000 square foot exhibit about the women's suffrage movement. That's the largest bestowal of democratic freedoms in the history of the United States. That movement. 51% got a legal right to vote guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution. Of course, there are other factors that took voting rights away, but your Constitution is your fundamental right. And everybody, universal suffrage. So I am Thank, this is what would thrill Elizabeth, is the grassroots involvement, not only of that museum, but then we had an organizing group of grassroots organizations in Louisville. It is stunning, stunning how many people are involved and what they're doing and the creativity. For instance, I don't even know her last name, Joyce, who's Joyce? Okay, Joyce, where's Joyce? Okay, hi Joyce. So Joyce, you impress me. She says, well, we have this papy mache full-size figure of um, uh, Mary uh, McLeod Bethune. She's like my favorite. She has a national park for her house. You know, that's like only, women aren't even in, represented in most national parks. And so I said, great, get that papy mache out. Then what happens, we met a sculptor today who's willing to work with that thing because it's a very sensitive fabric 
So we, we got the sculptor who's prepared to uh, do an armature inside so Mary doesn't fall over. And so we're going to put her in the Pegasus Parade. Yay! Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So you see how it all goes together? And there's nothing more important than what's happening here. And that's the beauty of it. In July, I met the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass. Oh, wow. And we came from two different directions. We met on the front yard of Elizabeth Cady Stanton's home in Seneca Falls. Wow. wow. That's powerful. Yes, it is. I mean, for is. me it is. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh. Well, yeah, yeah. I would love to, because um, there's. If you go back to the woman who sculpted that, she had a very clear vision. First of all, they are rising up out of the big block of stone. They're rising out of tyranny. That's her intent. Then she chose those three women. Then she has exactly what you're describing, this uncarved piece. And her intent was to tell everybody who looked at that statue, you have the right to vote, but your work is not finished. Yeah. That is the unfinished work of uh, women's rights. But I went to a rally, and I met another great experience, Gregory Oh, gosh. Uh, who taught literacy? Oh, my God. Um, so you're going to help me. But um, the point is that there was some belief that carve another person there. Well, one way to deal with it was uh, there was a, a new contract with a sculptor to create a bust of Sojourner Truth. And she is now at the Capitol, too. So I just want to say, I want to say something really important. I have a daughter, and I have a son. And rights is not a question of men get them or women get them. It's not either or. I have a very close relative who had a stroke. And the problem with a stroke is half your body dies, half your body's dysfunctional, you can't walk, you can't balance, you can't write, sometimes you can't talk. Having a body that is half functional is very bad idea. Having America, strong men, weak women, is a very bad idea. It's like a body with a stroke. And all I'm saying is please, make both sides of the body as strong as possible. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Men can get a lot out of this, too, when they talk about the rights that they want. So don't be intimidated. And it's, just make the strongest America you can make. And we're going to let that be the last word. Thank you so much. Thank you.